Hello, my name is Nathan Rafato. I'm a mathematics major at Carroll College, and for my senior project, I looked into applications of the Fourier transform, specifically in modeling sound, and in particular the human voice. Now, before we get into definitions, I want to show you a couple of things. So, for now, I'll just have you watch and listen. <laughs> time. All right, so what did we just see? Well, in the first visualization, we saw some waveforms. You might have noticed the amplitude increase during the louder sections, or perhaps you even noticed the speed of the oscillations vary as the different notes were played. Now this first visualization shows us position over time, which is directly related to how the sound is recorded and processed in the first place. But this second visualization perhaps corresponds more closely to our experience of sound because we can see the different notes played in different places um, where the loudness is, uh, is represented by the intensity of the color. Now indeed this second visualization is a frequency over time plot. So we have frequency on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And even if I now if I zoom out it even looks as if the musical score was painted onto the computer screen. But I assure you that this program has no access to the musical score. Um, so the question at this point is, how did we get from a position over time plot to a frequency over time plot? And now is a good time to fill in some background. So. Joseph Fourier was a French mathematician in the late 18th and early 19th century. In his life, he contributed a lot to what we know about heat transfer today, but his contributions in that field have spilled over to many other fields, including sound. And one of his most important contributions, at least most fundamental, is, his Fourier, is Fourier's theorem, which states that any continuous periodic function can be expressed as a sum of sines and cosines. Now, this might be pretty unintuitive when we consider examples such as the, when we consider waveforms such as the sawtooth wave or the square wave or the uh, triangle wave, but indeed each of these um, has its own formulation in terms of sines and cosines. And we won't go over that formulation in this presentation, but if we know that these can be represented in, in that way, then certainly. Um, we can imagine audio data being represented in that way. Um, so, in addition to Fourier's theorem, we also have Fourier's transform. So, if you understand nothing else about uh, the Fourier transform, it's important to know that it takes position over time data, position over time functions, and turns them into fr uh, magnitude over frequency functions. So, you can see the there are two sort of oscillations contained in this first plot. So there's a, this larger oscillation with a lower frequency. And now that corresponds to, here's our frequency on the horizontal axis. That corresponds to this, this larger um, lower spike. And there's also a, little, a smaller oscillation that's more frequent. And this corresponds to this higher frequency spike. And now, also, their amplitude corresponds roughly to the um, to the peak of each spike. Okay, so in mathematical terms, um, this is basically a set of inner products where the 
um, our the omega is our frequency variable and now as our omega value approaches one of the frequencies contained in um, in our function the orthogonality between these two functions decreases and so their um, their inner product is resolved to a non-zero value so you see it's zero pretty much everywhere else except for um, getting around to the frequencies contained in this function now another way to think about it is from a physics standpoint so an analogy is suppose that this function is an object with a set of natural frequencies and the e to the i omega x is a tone generator now as as the pitch of the tone approaches one of the natural frequencies contained in this object then their the resonance between these two increases and so that corresponds to the spikes okay so that's the Fourier transform now one important aspect about it is that it is invertible so if we take the inverse of this uh, of this function we get this function so here's the inverse function it's quite similar um, to the original but um, the cool thing about this is the Fourier transform can be manipulated so we can we can manipulate the frequencies independently of each other um, so for example here I've diminished um, I've diminished the second higher frequency and because it's invertible we can say okay what function would have produced this plot and it turns out that it produces a very similar pl similar plot just without that second set of oscillations and so this has a lot of really cool real-world uh, applications for example suppose you want to record a video for a surf presentation but you live in Trinity Hall where the air conditioner makes a low rumbling noise it's pretty annoying well you're in luck though because all you have to do is take the Fourier transform of your audio file um, diminish the unwanted frequencies invert the transform and you're left with the original audio file just without those unwanted uh, frequencies okay so we still really haven't answered our original question which is how do we get from position over time to frequency over time because the Fourier transform takes us from position over time to magnitude over frequency um, and if we were to take the Fourier transform of that audio file that I played in the beginning we wouldn't see the different notes at different times we would just see I guess all the notes at once um, and, and on this all on the same two-dimensional plot well the solution is actually pretty simple we can split the audio file into a bunch of little segments at different times we can take the Fourier transform at each of those times for each of those segments string the transforms together um, in the same order that the segments were taken and we're left with uh, what at each time what frequencies are present and so I was actually able to replicate this I used um, a little audio file of a clip from uh, one of a canticle of Hildegard von Bingen and so I'll play it for you and you, you can kind of trace the trace the sound trace the pitch as it goes as we progress through the audio file all right so now I think we have a pretty good idea of some of the applications of the Fourier transform but what about in modeling sound because we know that we if we have periodic continuous um, audio data the Fourier Fourier's theorem states that um, that can be represented as a sum of sines and cosines so for this project I've actually decided instead of using a linear combination of sines and cosines it's better just to allow for a shift in phase and use um, just sine functions and that seems to me easier to fit into a curve fitting algorithm um, and for for this case we'll use the least least squares regression um, now for many functions um, they're relatively insensitive to the starting parameters we feed into a 
curve fitting algorithms such as uh, linear functions, quadratic functions, even uh, exponential functions. But for periodic functions, there are many uh, local minimums other than the global minimums as the least squares algorithm is manipulating the parameters. Um, and so for this type of problem, we, we will need to guarantee that the freak, at least the frequency parameters start pretty close um, to the true uh, to the true frequency of the sample. Thankfully, the Fourier transform actually does just that because it gives us spikes at the different frequencies contained in, in the samples. So um, here we can get a little more detailed. So we have our audio data coming in. We take the Fourier transform, which gives us this information, and we can actually count the number of spikes to determine how many terms in our in our equation we'll use. So for each of the spikes, um, as I said earlier, the magnitude corresponds roughly to the amplitude of the of the original function, um, and then the the x-axis, of course, corresponds to the frequency. So we can feed those in for each one. We can take this whole thing, uh, use the least squares regression on it, along with the audio data, and that gives us an optimized function, which is actually pretty impressive when we plot it. And now this, this data here is me making the ah noise just for one constant pitch. We can actually hear the result in this next slide. So I'll play the original audio file. And here is the modeled audio. So a couple of things to notice. For one, this model was a lot more muffled, seemingly, than, than the original audio file. Now, this is because our model doesn't account for white noise that's contained in most, uh, that's, well, it's contained in human voice, simply. Um, and we're really just modeling for what's the, sort of the noise produced by the vocal cords, the kind of regular pulse produced by the vocal cords. So that's, that's why it's a little more muffled. Um, you probably also noticed, noticed a rapid clicking noise. Now that's actually because we're um, we're not modeling the whole sample at once. We're actually using the same technique as we used to create that three-dimensional uh, graphic. So we're taking the original audio file, cutting it, cutting it up into small segments, um, and then we're stringing those, or modeling for each of those, and stringing them back together um, to produce our model. And now this actually allows, uh, it turns out this allows for s audio samples that vary in pitch and volume. Um, and so it allows us to model more complex audio. But as we do attempt to model more complex audio, it turns out that oftentimes um, the the frequencies obtained from the Fourier transform are not close enough, are not quite close enough. And so um, a way that I discovered to, to solve this problem is actually to repeat the last step multiple times, or at least as many times as we want. And so what we're actually doing here is instead of feeding the whole, um, the whole audio segment into the least squares regression at once, we're basically forcing the, um, the clip to be small enough, uh, the clip that we're feeding in to be small enough that the that the local minimum found is actually the global minimum. And so we can take, we can actually take the optimized parameters found from that, um, increase the, the size of the clip that we're feeding into the regression, um, and then perform the least squares again. And it, we're, with baby steps, we're, we're, I guess, building a more robust model um, at each, for each segment. And so we, we do this as many times as we want, and it turns out this actually works a lot better. Um, and so we're able to model more uh, complex uh, audio files, as I've done here. So um, here you might recognize this audio clip from The Lord of the Rings. Looks like meat's back on my menu, boy! And so there's a couple things to notice. There is, so a lot of modulation and volume. 
in pitch, and even in vowel sounds. Um, so, so theoretically, this is a lot more challenging to model than just a constant pitch, one vowel sound, relatively constant volume as well. So here I'll play the modeled version. So I don't know how impressive that is to you. Um, I think it's pretty fun. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boy! So obviously there's still a lot of clipping, um, and it's uh, it's almost it almost sounds pixelated. Um, but there are a couple of ways that I haven't had time yet to totally get into. But a couple of ways we could improve um, this model. Uh, one is we could actually instead of using constant parameters, we could fit polynomials to the different frequency and amplitude parameters found throughout the sample and that would actually smooth out our sample so we wouldn't have any clipping between little segments um, and that would actually give us a lot more control over the sample once we've recorded it. Another uh, improvement we could make is actually constructing a model for white noise. Um, now this likely wouldn't use a least squares regression but we could sort of analyze, we could do a Fourier analysis um, for some of the white noise once we've modeled the um, once we've modeled the noise coming from the vocal cords um, and this would also just improve the real realism of the model um, but for now that's all I have and so I just want to thank you for your time thanks for watching <laughs>